You guys know this one? Sing it with us. Here we go. Lord of all creation, water, earth, and sky, the heavens are your tabernacle, glory to the Lord on night. Thank you for singing with us. You can be seated. Thank you so much. God bless. All right. Good morning to everyone. I'm glad to see everyone's awake. I don't know if anybody else had any issues waking up this morning, but I did. <laughs> um, I'm not a morning person, so I'm glad our service is at 11 o'clock. Um, so, good morning to all of you, and those of you worshiping in online, I don't blame you for not wanting to get out of your house. Um, so, we have the 21 Days of Hope coming up. Um, that is going to start today, um, and this is bringing an experience of hope to you and through you, and if you don't know anything about it, or you haven't registered or whatever, you can go to smithfieldchristian.com slash 21 Days of Hope. Um, for more info. Easter, we are doing two services. We have been at this church for, what, almost seven years, I think, and we've never done two services. This is exciting. I'm, I'm excited about this. Um, so we're asking you to register. Um, you can do that on the website, smithfieldchristian.com slash Easter. And um, we have a nine o'clock service and 11 o'clock service. However, if you have children, please register for the 11 o'clock service because we won't have kids' classes at the 9 o'clock. Um, we have a work day coming up 
next Saturday, and um, there is, I believe there is an event on Facebook for it that you can join, accept, whatever the terminology is for that, um, and come on out Saturday morning. It's only going to be a couple hours, but many hands make light work. So the more people we have come out, the more we can get done, and we really want to spruce things up some um, for any of our new faces that show up for Easter, which would be great. And then um, lastly, for announcements, we have a lot of them today, sorry. Um, the kids egg hunt. Now, usually in, in years past, we do it on Palm Sunday after church, and we have a picnic, and you know, it's like a big thing for the whole church. This year, we're doing it a little different. Um, it's going to be the day before Palm Sunday on the 28th and from 2 to 4, 27th? Okay, sorry, 27th, from 2 to 4 um, at, here at the church, but it's going to be more family-oriented. Um, parents stick around with your kids, and we're not going to have a meal or anything like that. It's going to be like some family activities for each. And, um, and, and there will be an egg hunt as well. So um, with that, I also want to remind you about offering. If you would like to give, um, you can give in person. There is a plate at the table in the back. You can give on the website online, smithfieldchristian.com. There's a giving tab. Um, or you can even text the number, um, text give to the number on the screen. And here, sorry, I'm looking in the back. Um, <laughs> And um, that threw me off. Anyways, so that's just a way for us to uh, give back to God for all the ways that he blesses. us. So with that, um, let's pray and continue worshiping. God, I thank you for um, this time of year and just how everything is beginning to bloom and um, just things are, are looking new. And um, I thank you for... Um, just the change that that brings, the newness that that brings. And um, God, I pray for our service today and for everyone in this room. I pray that we all come before you this morning with open hearts um, for your word um, and just the, the many different aspects of worship this morning. And um, I pray for um, any uh, people that are involved in the service and uh, just speak through them and use them. Thank you so much for Jesus, and thank you so much for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Guys, if we could stand with us, we can do our worship. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Worship, right? So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to Highly exalted, glorious in heaven. 
you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Lift it up, you ready? So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. Amen, man. Lift it up, right? Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good. The king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song. You are good, good. I hear you guys out there singing. Sounds mm -hmm. great. Come 
Thank you for singing. You may be seated. There is so much scripture in that song. You can find it and pick it out all through it. All right. We're going to do a little bit of uh, an echo test in here. So I'm going to need your participation a little bit, okay? And I'm, I'm going to let you know up front, and, so, and I apologize, uh, online church family, you might not catch uh, the echo piece of it. But I'm going to tell you up front two things. Um, the word Lord and up are going to have two syllables. And in the spirit of humility, in my head, you guys have blown me out of the water, okay? 
and our humility is our theme, okay? So here's what I want you to do. I want you to sing after me, and I'll, I'll give you the indication. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself from the sight of the Lord. And he will pick you up. And he will lift you up. All right. I was going to say that was great. I wrote that down here, but no offense. That was <laughs> mediocre. And I thank this side. <laughs> All right, so let's focus. I'm going to focus our thoughts on humility. But I'm going to do it through uh, three words. Lost, loss, and death on a cross. So maybe more than three words. Lost, loss, and death on a cross. Last week, Joe spoke uh, about the lost, the lost sheep, lost out of his ignorance, ignorant that they were getting into dangerous uh, situations, ignorant that they weren't realizing that they were lost in their current situation that was seemingly so good. The lost coin, lost maybe through no circumstances of their own, but nevertheless lost. And a lost son and his older brother. One lost in their prideful ways over God's ways, the other so close to home, yet so far from it, not realizing that he was lost. And in all of these uh, parables of Jesus, there can be, you can see Jesus reaching out, immediate, constant, searching, and desiring to have the lost be found and come home. There was a lot of meat on Joe's sermon last Sunday. I think there was more meat than a New York deli contestant just before lunch. It was packed full. And I encourage you, if you didn't hear it, go online and catch it. If you know someone who's lost, if you're lost, pray and gently go back and guide them to that message. It was a fantastic message. God is always drawing near and knocking at the door. James 4, 8 Alpha, Revelations 3, 20, two songs ago. Loss. This is a hard one. Sunday night, uh, our, our male dog, a brother and sister, or the brother or sister that we've had for 12 years, um, had a a, a bad event related to his doggy version of Parkinson's. And when we woke up Sunday mo Monday morning to stuff all over the floor, I, I kind of knew it was going to be close to the end. He, he didn't suffer, but he struggled breathing through Monday. Tuesday, he could barely lift his tired, weary bones off the ground, struggling to get outside to go and do his business, just couldn't do it. I carried him in and out of the house. And then Tuesday afternoon, as my daughter Katie and I were loving on him, <clears throat> he passed away. In those moments after, this is what really hit home. In those moments after, I realized, yeah, that was nothing like the death of a family member so close, a brother or a sister, a mother or father, a close friend. That pain that I still feel now is nothing compared to the pain God must feel when he loses one of his. That pain, you know it's got to be hard. Because he sent his son down to earth to seek and save the lost, to save the world through him. John 3, 16, Luke 9, verse 10. That has to be so hard for him to experience. And so now I'm looking at my pain, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what you must go through. So what was Jesus' response? His response was humility. He left heaven, took on human form, humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Philippians 6, 2, 6 through 8. So what's our response? First, we need to humble ourselves before God, and he will lift you up. 
It's, out, it's throughout scriptures. But I can cite Proverbs 3, 34, 1 Peter 5, verse 6 and 7, James 4, 1 through 10, especially verse 10. It includes, this humility includes how we treat ourselves. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. In our service to others, Romans 12, 3 through 8. And how we imitate Christ's humility in all things and take on his mindset in how we think, how we act, how we respond in our relationships. We have the mindset like Jesus, Philippians 2, 1 through 8. Let me reread Philippians 6, verses 8. Uh, Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's how much God loves us. That's how much Jesus loves us. That's how much we should love like Jesus. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, I am so thankful you use life lessons and parables to teach us things that we might not grasp on our own. That you love us so much that would you would son, send your son, Jesus Christ, down to earth to become a person, to suffer as a person, to go through experiences that we do, we know Jesus wept. We know he felt sorrow and pain. And he endured that. And he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, because he loves us. Father, we, we pray that we keep that mindset of how much you love us and what you must experience of a lost child. And we pray we do our part to reach out to the lost and bring them home and point them in the way. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
I won't make you sing this time. I've got some uh, praises and prayer requests, and again, you can you can put them down in the card there. You can also submit online. Naomi uh, Wills, her mother-in-law Catherine is in the hospital. And uh, I probably pronounced this wrong, but Mona uh, Seifer, the sister-in-law of Jean Gonzalez, she has stage three lung cancer. Let's pray for her spiritual health and comfort on behalf of the family. They, they have some hard stuff coming. And then for Sharon, that her upcoming uh, test has good results, and she thanks us for answered uh, prayers. And then, I don't know if you remember last Sunday, we praised for Mike Hargan, that he gets a job, a very specific job, and that it, gets, it fits with him, and he starts his new job April 1st. And then uh, another personal blessing, uh, definitely for the Lawson family, um, Haley's out of the hospital, so I'm loving that. <laughs> Let's go to the God in prayer. Father God, we know that you're aware of everything, but you specifically tell us, bring those prayers and praises directly to you and lay them at your feet. Elevate the praises and put the credit where credit is due. Father, we are we're thankful that you answer prayers. And we understand, yes, sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's wait. But you still answer them. Father, we pray for Sharon that her, her upcoming tests have good results. And she is thankful for those who are praying on her behalf. We pray for Catherine Naomi Will's mother-in-law who's in the hospital. Please be with her, those surrounding her, those tending to her. And let it be an encouragement and have her quickly be restored to health. We pray for Miss Seifer, sister-in-law of Jean Gonzalez. Father, stage three cancer in the lungs. That is some scary stuff. We pray for her, for spiritual health, for healing, for whatever it is you have desired, but... More than anything on these prayer requests, Father, we know that the most important thing is a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. And we pray that that, that that takes place, that that is elevated, that you are glorified. Father, we, we also lift up these praises that we know you had a hand in. We prayed last week for a job on behalf of Mike, and April 1st he starts. We prayed for Haley to be out of the hospital, and she's here this month, Sunday morning. And again, Father, I get it. Sometimes it's no. Sometimes it's yes. Sometimes it's wait. But in every time, there's an answer. And that is amazing. We thank you, Jesus, who is the door that opens the way that we might enter the throne room of God. And in all this, we thank you, God, that you love us so much. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. about our Easter service uh, before we jump into things. Uh, first of all, you probably saw in your bulletin, um, 
first of all, you probably saw that we have a very organized person who puts things in bulletins now because this is no longer a bulletin bomb. It doesn't fall out when you open up your bulletin like it used to. We used to always call those bulletin bombs because I would just jam them in there and hope they would, you know, not get lost. But wonderful Stephanie way to paper clips them, took the time to paper clip them in, and she's not even here for us to thank her. But uh, she may be online. If you're watching online, Stephanie, thank you so much. A couple things, though. This, I always tell you, is not for you, okay? Do not take this home. Do not put this on your refrigerator. Do not put this anywhere for you. This is for you to give to someone, okay? You are to invite someone to come and worship with you in person or online for Easter. So take this and, um, and, and don't even do the lazy way of like leaving this with your tip at lunch today, okay? You got to talk to somebody and say, I'd love for you to come to church with me on Easter. Here you go. Here's some information about it. Uh, there's information on the back there. Also, there is a misprint, my fault, in the bulletin. It, it, in there, it said there's something about you can register at the, at the info station for our Easter service. That's not true. That's not accurate. We are asking you to go online, smithfieldchristian.com slash Easter, where you can sign up for one of our two Easter services um, and be a part of that I'm excited for Easter. It's coming soon. We are in, in that time of year. It's crazy even to think that we're running up on Easter already. But we're in that weird time of year, you know, where weather is kind of uh, hit or miss back and forth all over the place. At one, at one moment, I was cold when I walked in, and then I was hot, and now I'm chilly. It's just, you know, maybe... I'm going through, you know, hot flashes or something. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but I'm excited that Easter's coming up. I'm excited for spring to be here. Now, and in the 1940s, there was a guy by the name of Sam Rayburn who was serving as the Speaker of the House of Representatives of the United States Congress, and he served for 17 years. And as the Speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn, he, he had a, a lot of power, a lot of influence. I mean, it's kind of a prestigious kind of position to hold. And, and not only that, he was actually being the, the Speaker of the House. You are third in line for uh, succession of the presidency, sh should there be something that happens to the president or the vice president. Well, one day, he found out that the teenage daughter of a reporter friend of his had tragically and suddenly died. So, early the next morning, Sam, uh, the Speaker of the House, goes out and knocks on his friend's front door. And when the door was open, um, Sam just simply asks, is there anything that I can do to help? His friend, as you can imagine, was kind of stunned that the Speaker of the House was there at his front door and asking to help out with the situation. And he just sort of said, well, no, we really appreciate that. We're just doing everything we can right now to make arrangements. And so uh, Rayburn asked, well, have you had coffee this morning? And they said, well, no, we really haven't had time. So he said, well, at least let me come in and make coffee for you guys. So he came in, the Speaker of the House came into this house and made coffee for them. And as, as this reporter watched this very powerful person make him coffee he said it said that he suddenly remembered something and so he asked the, the speaker he said mr speaker i thought you were supposed to have breakfast at the white house with the president this morning and so he replied back and said well i, I was but i called the president and i told him that i had a friend who was in trouble and i couldn't come there are there are moments in life there are points in life when we are just blown away by the humility of certain people, this just this these incredible acts of humility, this incredible uh, humility. Now, humility is not thinking of yourself as worthless or thinking of yourself as not as good as someone else, or that that you will never amount to anything. You know, it's not like looking down on yourself. I, I I heard a really great definition of humility one time, and it was that humility is not thinking less of yourself; it's thinking of yourself less. If that makes sense, it's not thinking less of yourself. It's just not always thinking about yourself. It's about putting others and putting their needs ahead of your own. But the sad truth about humility is that at times it is so rare in our culture, in our world today, that we are kind of blown away by it when we see it in other people. We're kind of shocked by it. And you've probably experienced this. Maybe there's somebody in your life who is just a very humble person who is always thinking of others. Maybe they've thought of you at different times. Maybe that, it's that person that on the way to work, they, they stopped to get breakfast and they grabbed you breakfast as well. Maybe they're the person that every time that they go out to pull up their trash can from the curb, they grab your trash can um, as well. You know, we see these things and we experience these things and it, and it blows us away, just the, the humility that these people have, the way they go out of their way to try and help us out. And we think, man, what a great person. You know, what, it's so great. They would, how, why would they think of me? Why would they do this for me? But it strikes us because it's not the norm, because it's out of the norm. You see, what, what truly is the norm of our culture is more about 
ourself. It's more about promoting ourself. It's about getting what we want. It's about doing things our way. It's about having the things that we like. Now, maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, yeah, but that's not me. I mean, I don't, I don't do that. Well, I want you to think for a moment. Here's a little, we're going to do a little self-evaluation for a moment, okay? We're not going to, we're not going to make you share this with anybody. I want you to think for a moment to yourself. What do you do when someone wrongs you? Are you ready to hurl the lightning bolts? You know, you're ready to zap them or ready to just to get some zingers out there, get back at them? Or, or maybe you don't retaliate, but maybe you wait till you get to work and you tell your coworkers, you will never believe what happened. And you just start telling them all kinds of stuff and you just let the gossip train just fly. All while never really even considering why that person might have reacted in that way. I mean, maybe there's a bad thing going on in their life. Maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe there's a bad situation. Maybe they just came from a crisis and it's put them into a, a bad attitude or a bad moment. That's maybe the reason why they're treating other people that way. You know, we say things or we hear things said like, well, you got to earn respect. Really? You have to earn respect? We can't just respect people because we're people? Or, or how about this? Consider this. What is your normal reaction when you've realized that you've messed up, when you've done something wrong, do you try to hide it? Do you find a way to divert attention from yourself onto someone else or something else? Do you, or do you own the mistake and maybe even own the hurt that has come along with that mistake? Or even how do you make decisions in your life? Do you base them on others or do you base them on yourself? What you like, what you prefer, what you want. And this is everything from small things like maybe where, you're go, where are you go to eat lunch this afternoon um, all the way to important things like maybe something at work when others have an opinion about a direction to go with a project or a major decision. You see, too often we think that humility and arrogance – are kind of like the extremes, right? Or, or that it has to do with other people. But the truth is that humility is played out, or at least it should be played out in a lot more often, way, a lot more ways in, in our life more often than what it is. And today we're going to look at Jesus' teaching, focus in on this, this concept, this idea of humility. And I think in some ways it's a very difficult one for us to stick with and to be honest and be true about it. We're going to be in Luke chapter 18. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn there or flip there on your digital device or whatever, we'll have our text up on the screen. Uh, but we're, gonna, we're kind of moving closer and closer towards the, the back part of, of the Gospel of Luke. In fact, next Sunday, um, we're going to be looking at Jesus' triumphal entry coming into Jerusalem where he's going to spend his last week before his crucifixion and his, re and his resurrection. But today, we, we're going to see this in Luke 18. Jesus is going to use another parable, another opportunity to teach and use a story to make a really important point. So we pick this up in verse 9. Jesus says this, or it says this about Jesus. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Now, Troy, don't take that away. Take your finger off the button. I want you to see, I want you to catch what that just said there. To some who were confident about their own righteousness, to think of yourself in such a way that, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty righteous. I mean, I'm pretty holy. I mean, I do things right. I get everything right. Or those who looked down on everyone else, I mean, wow, that's some, that's some pretty tough stuff. That these people, that this, their attitude. And like I said, you know, weeks ago we studied a passage kind of similar to this kind of gravity. And sometimes we like to sort of think of others in this situation. Perhaps we need to take a moment and sort of plant ourselves into this passage. To Joe Thompson, who was confident about his own righteousness and looked down on other people. Maybe we need to put ourselves in here and just for this moment, just for this morning. Well, let's keep on going in verse 10 now. Two men went up to a temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like, the, like, not like other people, robbers and evildoers and adulterers and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. So let's kind of pause there for a moment in this parable before we see the rest of the parable. Jesus kind of paints this picture of, the, of this, this man here, and he's using this, this, this parable like he's done so many times to make a point here. And this has to do with this man's arrogance, and hopefully we're going to see in a little bit some humility. 
But he sets this scene of there being a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, in Jesus' day, to say those two types of terms, those two different types of people in the same breath, I mean, people can kind of picture that in their mind. And you can come up with all kinds of, you know, analogies for modern day today of what that would be. But these people would be sort of at the opposite ends of the spiritual spectrum, I guess you could say. And the one that you would expect to be whole or to be humble, the one that you would expect to be the one who comes to God in humility is actually the one who prayed in arrogance. There was someone who once said that you can pray in a lot of different ways. One way that we pray sometimes is for others. Now, I don't mean when I say in this moment, in this context right here, I don't mean when we pray for others, I don't mean praying on behalf of others. What I mean is that sometimes we pray for others to hear us. We pray for others to hear what we are saying. Maybe we use flowery language. Maybe we use big churchy words or words that you would never use in any other context, in any other conversation. But today when you're praying, I'm going to pull out some of those big fancy words. Or maybe we say it in, in such a way to try and impress people around us. Maybe you pray large passages of scripture out loud so people can know that you know the Bible and you've heard these things. In Proverbs 26, it's written in verse 12, Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. You see, more often than not, the only person that those people who are praying for others to hear, the only person that they're really impressing is just themselves. You see, they're not, they're not praying for God to hear them. And, and truly, I don't even know, even though they may be saying the words about others and their needs, they might not even be praying for those people and really even concerned about those needs. All they're concerned about is making sure that others hear how wonderful of a prayer they are. It, we can also pray, this person said, that we can also pray for myself. Now, just like I didn't mean praying on behalf of others, I also don't mean praying on behalf of ourselves for our own needs. But I mean that sometimes we can pray in such a way that we're trying to build our own confidence, build our own self up, our own ego there. You know, the ego is such a funny thing. The ego is something that is so powerful that it can blind us and make us deaf to things that are so plain and so apparent and evident to everyone else around us. But we just have no clue. And if you don't believe me, then that's the reason that American Idol and other shows like that became so popular back in the early 2000s. You see, this, this show not only uh, showcased the talents of a lot of wonderful singers and other, other shows like this uh, showcased a lot of wonderful talent of, of people that are really incredible, but it also put on display some of the very naive, maybe, very uh, uh, tone-deaf uh, people that would go out there, and maybe grandma told them one time when they were young that, man, they just have a lovely voice, and ever since then, they just had no clue, and they were so confident and the ego was built up so much that they thought that they were just wonderful. They were awesome. But really all they were doing was just being blind or being deaf to their own shortcomings. You see, this is why we need to be careful when we build ourselves up, when we, when we become so confident in ourselves. Galatians 6 uh, says this, If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. Again, we're not fooling anybody else. We're deceiving ourselves. You see, we can pray sometimes in a way that we might be trying to impress others. We might be trying to build ourselves up. Um, and just like this Pharisee here, and we miss the whole point of why we're praying. God, I thank you that I don't sin like other people do. I don't have their problems. God, I thank you I'm not like that person I encountered before work. God, I thank you so much that I'm not, I don't drive like that person that cut me off earlier. God, I th and we could go on and on, but we pray in such a way that we're more, more focused on all these other things and missing the whole point, which brings us to the third way we probably should be praying, and that is for God. We should be praying for God. Author R.A. Torrey said this, a really powerful statement. He said, not a single syllable should be uttered in prayer, either in public or in private, until we are really conscious that we are coming into God's presence. He's saying we shouldn't even start. We shouldn't say a word. In fact, I had a professor in, in, in Bible college that he would pause pause for a good amount of time where it's almost like, is he, is he praying or am I praying? I, I, don't, I don't remember what's going on here. Like, you know, it was kind of awkward almost at first until, you know, until after a few classes and we got the point, okay, Bob pauses, but he would do this to take a moment and to recognize what was going on here. You see, we should come to God in such humility and remember and recognize not only who we are, 
but who he is. There's a powerful situation in Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah was a prophet in the Old Testament. He was a spokesman for God. But before he was sent out to speak on behalf of God, God gives him a vision, opens up his throne room of heaven for Isaiah to see. And it's recorded in Isaiah chapter 6 when he experiences that. In verse 5, we see Isaiah's reaction to it all. He says, woe to me, I cried. I am, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah was saying, I I, I don't belong here. I shouldn't be here. I'm a sinner. I'm unclean. The people around are unclean. I should not be here. Or even, even John, when he was by himself on the island of Patmos, and God gave him a glimpse of heaven, and he opened up the throne room of God. In Revelation 1, 17, it's recorded. It says this about John. It says, when I saw him, when I saw the Lord, I fell at his feet as though dead. He just collapses because of seeing God, of seeing him in all of his majesty, seeing God for who he really is and recognizing who he was personally. You see, we need to acknowledge, we need to recognize who we're speaking to whenever we pray. Now, this doesn't mean that we have to become, you know, we have to go into King James English all of a sudden and kind of speak in that way, but it needs to be done in humility and in respect. You see, there's this interesting paradox or this interesting kind of tension that happens in our relationship with God. You see, on the one hand, he is God, the creator of everything, the one who spoke everything in creation and could unspeak everything out of creation, so to speak. I mean, that is the one that we're speaking to. But then on the other hand, he's our father. He is our our dad. He is the one that we should feel comfortable enough to walk in at any time into his throne room and to speak with him. There was a, a, a minister of a church, very large church, thousands of people at, uh, at this church out in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and he talked about when he was a young minister, he made it a policy for their church that anytime someone was going to be on stage, they had uh, any men had to wear a coat and tie. For him, he felt like it was a sign of respect, um, and he felt like, you know, it just, you needed to have that type of thing. And, and they hired this young minister um, to be an associate minister at their church, and the young minister kind of respectfully kind of gave some feedback or pushback on the policy of the coat and tie. I'd be the same way. Um, and he, uh, he kind of just shared, you know, I, I don't know if I like doing that. You know, what's the deal with that? You know, and, and so the, the senior minister kind of said, well, look, you know, if you were going to go have lunch with, with, uh, with the governor, um, if you were going to have some lunch with someone who was in an important position of of authority and power, you know, how, wouldn't you wouldn't you dress the best that you possibly could? And the young minister answered back and said, "Well, not if he's my dad." And and the senior minister said, "You know, I've never really had a good comeback for that." And so they they changed the policy and they said, "You know, we've got to have this tension. We've got to have this balance." Man, we are speaking to our Father, but we are speaking to the God of the universe. We need to remember who our Father is. So let's go and see what the other person in the parable, how they pray. Verse 13. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other one, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves, will be exalted. And when was the last time you prayed like that? Have you ever (laughs) prayed in that manner? Have you ever prayed with that much conviction and humility and remorse? You see, in, the, in, in those days, when they would, when they would feel the, the, the weight, the pain of their sin, when they would feel the weight and the pain of, of who they really were and coming into the presence of God, or even if there was times in their life when they needed to show the, their repentance, they would do it in such uh, big and pronounced ways. Sometimes they would tear their clothes because of their, their anguish and their repentance. Sometimes they would put on what's called sackcloth, which was just very uncomfortable material to wear. They would even sit in ashes or put the ashes on their head to show just how and how much pain and anguish they were in to show that so people could see the remorse so people could see the repentance in their heart expressed in a physical way it's definitely not like how we do things nowadays how you doing i'm great it's wonderful life is good and sure we may be counting our blessings in god but maybe there's something within that we are burying down and we're pretending like everything's perfect 
and I'm perfect, and I'm wonderful, and everything's good. You see, these two men stand in stark contrast of each other. One, in his confidence and in his arrogance, comes before God. The other one comes in humility. But which one does Jesus encourage us to be like? In some ways, again, you would think that Jesus would encourage us to be like the Pharisee, right? I mean, you would think that he's the religious one. He's, he knows all the scriptures. He's been trained in all the, the religious ways. He knows when to stand, when to sit, when to clap, when to not, you know, all that different stuff that sometimes we're not sure about it, you know, if we're in a new context or something. You would think that Jesus would want us to be like the religious guy, not the tax collector, but it's him, the one who comes in humility. You see, you don't impress Jesus with, with confidence. You just don't. It doesn't matter how confident you are. You're not going to impress Jesus with your confidence. And truthfully, these two guys, in many ways, were very similar. They had a lot of similarities about them. Both of them obviously believed in God. Both of them wanted to participate in religious activities. Both of them had a sense of morality, of right and wrong. But the biggest difference, and probably the most important difference, was their humility. This is something humility that we don't always praise in our in our lives in our culture in our society we usually get excited about a person's confidence oh they were just so confident in what they were doing you know they really know who they are they really understand what it's all about we tell our kids to stand up for yourself but we often don't tell people no no no. why don't you why don't you sit down let someone else go why don't you put others ahead of yourself you see the problem is that oftentimes we want to trade even just confidence, self-confidence, for truly for arrogance, or even for self-centeredness. But over and over again, it is humility that Jesus praises, praises in our lives. In fact, in the very, uh, if you go all the way back to Matthew's gospel, in, in Matthew chapter 5, we see sort of the beginning of Jesus' ministry, and what's become now known as the Sermon on the Mount. It was a long sermon, I think it's like three, three chapters long, where Jesus is preaching, kind of what was the beginning of his, his uh, teaching career. And the very beginning of that beginning, he says these words in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You see, when, when we humble ourselves, in fact, even Jesus said that at the end of his parable there back in Luke, when we humble ourselves, Jesus lifts us up. Now, kind of as before we move away from this and keep on going with our text, I want to just kind of real quick say a word about prayer. You know, it's interesting, anytime Jesus ever teaches about prayer, he doesn't start his teaching with, hey, you should be praying. You see, he always just assumes that we're going to be praying, and we should be praying. But sometimes it seems like, man, that's one of the things that kind of goes by the wayside, and we forget about it, and we don't do that. Sometimes we're we're nervous about praying, and I mean even privately. Sometimes we're nervous about knowing what to say to God. Sometimes we feel uneasy or unsure, or sometimes maybe even, well, if we'd admit it, we sometimes feel like, well, maybe it doesn't work. Maybe there's, I'm just speaking to the ceiling, and it's just bouncing off, coming right back to me. But I want to encourage you, if prayer is, in, uh, is not a part of your life, or if it's not a part of your family life, you need to start now. You need to start small and find ways to, to make this opportunity, this great, this great privilege for us to come before our Father, our God, and just speak with Him. We have an awesome opportunity to walk before the God of the universe and share those concerns, share those praises and those things that excite us. Share those things, share those things from our heart with Him. Do that. Let's go back to our Luke passage. Look at this last situation about humility in verse 15 now. It says, People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on, on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will, will, will never enter it. Now, at first, when I was kind of planning out where we'd be studying in Luke, you know, we came, I came to this passage and said, oh, man, this is definitely something we're going to study. And we could have just spent the entire morning on here, but I decided to kind of back it up and get this other, um, other teaching and other section that Jesus has about humility. 
But before we kind of move from here and continue our, our, our theme and our focus of humility, I want to say something about kids and their faith. You see, we all have a responsibility to young people, to kids, to teenagers, and helping cultivate their faith. See, Jesus doesn't say, you know, they're too small to hear what I'm teaching about. They, they won't understand what's going on. You know, this, this probably isn't for their audience. It's going to be over their head. You, why don't you just take them home? I'll teach a kid's sermon some other time, and I'll do an object. No, Jesus said, let them come to me. Now, we don't force them. He doesn't say, force them to me. We don't force our children into faith. But I hear parents, or I hear grandparents sometimes say things like, well, I want to let them choose. And yeah, of course, you want their faith to be their faith. But friends, if we aren't taking steps to cultivate the faith of our children, if we aren't taking steps to help our kids to be guided to where they need to be, I'm sad to say that many of them are not going to make it there. So many times we see that the majority of people who come to faith do it before the age of 18. But so often we kind of have this idea like, oh, they'll figure it out when they get to college. I mean, of course, they'll be surrounded by so many good influences, right? You see, there's a big difference between us forcing our kids to love God and modeling for our kids to love God and guiding our kids to love God and trying to encourage those things. So friends, never, never diminish the opportunity, the privilege that we have to guide our children, our grandchildren, our nieces, our nephews, our neighbors. We all have a responsibility to them. But here, as Jesus is teaching and he's healing people, they start, they start bringing these children. They start bringing these babies to them. Now, some of them may, may need to uh, be healed from, from something going on in their life. For, for some of them, it may have just been for a blessing. A lot of times, there, would be, there was this practice of passing on a blessing that you would place your hand on, onto a child and, and bless that child. And so perhaps that was what was going on here. But whatever was happening, the disciples, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, this is the adult's time right now, right? We got children's church another time. No, I, I'm not going to batch on that. You know, we got, but he's like, this is not the time for that. Don't bring them right now. But, but they do this because like so often the disciples, they're missing the point of Jesus's ministry. We're going to see it again happen when we talk about the triumphal entry next week, that so many times people miss the whole point of Jesus's ministry. They get this idea of what it was about. Next week, we're going to see how they had this idea that, they were the, that Jesus would be this conquering king coming in mighty and powerful and taking over the government. But Jesus truly came in as the prince of peace. And here his disciples think that Jesus doesn't have time for kids. He's got more important things to do. But instead, instead, Jesus calls us to the humility of a child. And he uses children as a perfect example and illustration of what it means to truly be humble. Now, being, uh, having the humility of a child, this isn't like a Peter Pan thing where we, you never grow up. You can always just be a kid and always immature. This is not an excuse to be immature for the rest of our life. In fact, we're going to get to that in just a moment. But there are a few qualities about children that I think we can learn so much about, about how God expects us to live in humility. The first one has to do with trust. Kids trust their parents, the adults in their life, for so much. And most of the time, the majority of the time, those kids don't even realize that they're just trusting their parents to provide these things, whether it's food or shelter or clothing. I mean, it even gets to a point, at least in our house, where sometimes we have to have conversations and say, look, we have to buy these things, you know? They don't just get like mailed to us and voila, there it is, you know? We have to earn the money to buy these things and have stuff. And so sometimes we can't have certain things. And sometimes we have to say no about certain things. And, and, and if that ever happens in your house, don't take that as like, you know, as a bad thing. Take that as a, look at that as an understanding that your kids just trust you for these things so much and you've provided for them in such a way where they just completely trust you to take care of them. And that's how we should be with our Father, that we don't get so wrapped up and so built up and so worked up about, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? How am I going to do this? I'm take care of all these things. No, Jesus says, slow up, slow up. And specifically, he says in, Mar or in Matthew 6, in 30, verse 31, it says, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows, he knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. 
each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus tells us that we need to trust our Heavenly Father. Now, this is not a passive, lazy trust. Well, ah, God's got it. No big deal, whatever. I'm not going to worry about it here. But this is us trusting him, and Jesus tells us how we trust him, by seeking his kingdom and his righteousness, by living God's way, by doing life God's way, and God will take care of us. The second part I want to see about the characteristics and humility of a child that God calls us to is the joy. Kids have so much joy. We get to have some joy in the background there. I'm loving it back there. I get to sit back there and listen to him. What donut is he on? Two or three? Two? Man, he's ready for his third. He was asking for another one. He's asking for a third. I'm loving it. So, I, you know, there's something about kids and just joy. And they, sometimes it, is, it just, they can have joy in just everything. And, and sometimes Christians, we stink at joy. You know, we should be the most joyful people around. But then there are some Christians that are just so sour and so upset about every little situation. Oh, my life is so hard and so terrible. Yes, I'm sure it's awful sitting in our cushy chairs with our heat and air conditioning and light and Wi-Fi and, you know, all Starbucks and Krispy Kreme out in the lobby. Yeah, life is just so terrible for us. The Apostle Paul, when he was under house arrest, he was arrested for telling people about Jesus. He is sent to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. He's now under house arrest. And so he writes to Christians in Philippians 4. He says, my life is terrible. Yours is terrible too. No, that's not what he says. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. He even says, when he writes to the church in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice always always. This guy sitting chained up in house arrest, if, if he can talk about having joy, if he can talk about rejoicing in Jesus, then we, in our comfy lifestyles, we need to get over ourselves, and we need to move on from being so upset and so mad and so frustrated and find some joy. But too often, Christians are just so grumpy and always fussing and complaining, whether it's fussing in person, or fussing online, or complaining online. In fact, I want to I challenge you with this. Why don't you go home today, if you're on social media, look over your past several posts. Is there anything positive in there, or are you constantly griping and fussing and complaining about the government, your boss, your siblings, your parents, your children, your job, your house, your grass, your car, whatever it is? Folks, come on. We have such joy And we should be sharing that joy with people. The third thing that I think stands out to me about kids, and I think what God is calling us to and this characteristics of their humility, is their growth. The way that kids grow. Recognizing that, you know, I don't have it all together, that I don't know everything, that there's always room to grow. And and just like kids grow, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, right? Obviously, it takes some time. And sometimes we have this unfair perception or expectation of ourselves that, you know, I I mean, I gave my life to the Lord. I'm trusting God with my life, and I just don't know why everything's not better. I don't know why everything hasn't fixed, hasn't fixed itself, but we should be, we should be growing and taking that time to allow God to grow us and be patient with that. And it doesn't always just mean, I think sometimes when we think about growing in our, in, in, in our, in the Lord, I think sometimes we always think it means like knowledge. I've got to learn more. I've got to learn more. I've got to learn more. And sometimes it is about growing in our knowledge of the scriptures or growing in a knowledge of our, of our faith or whatever it might be. But sometimes it's also growing in things like our trust. In 1 Peter 5, 7, Peter writes and says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Cast all of your anxiety on him. Man, that takes a lot of trust to, to let go of some of those things. It's like, well, but, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang on to this one, God. I, I'm going to take care of this. If you could cover all this other stuff, God, I'll take care of this one. We'll be good. No, Peter says, cast all of your anxiety. Sometimes we need to grow in our, in our prayer and in our peace. Paul writes in Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, my kids are 8 and 10 right now. Brennan's going to have a birthday in a couple weeks. He's going to be 11, and that's just like, blows my mind. Yeah, it's seriously, it's, just, it's crazy. And I think about how fast they grow up. 
And truly, it's taken a long time. I mean, you think about it, it does take a long time, 10, 11 years, you know. But it has gone so fast. And to the point where we all say, you know, you turn around and they're grown up. You turn around, they're driving, whatever it might be, all these different things. And, and friends, I know that sometimes as Christians, we can feel like the growth that we want to see in our life, the, the places that we want to grow to, it can feel like it's just such a huge mountain. But I promise you this. If you climb that mountain with God's help through God's spirit, one step at a time, little by little, the same thing that is true for how I perceive my kids, or the same thing will be true for your growth in the Lord. All of a sudden, you'll look over your shoulder and say, that's where I came from? You'll look back on the person that you were yesterday and last year and so many years ago, and you'll say, man, God, God's done some awesome things in my life, and he has grown me. And he has brought me to new places and developed my faith in such awesome ways. We've got to be growing just as, just as kids do. You know, humility is not always easy, but man, it is a, it's a powerful and amazing thing. I may or may not have shared about this, this man um, before, but it's such a powerful illustration that I couldn't pass it up sharing it again. The CEO, former CEO of Home Depot by the name of Frank Blake um, when he was when he when he, was, when he was in his role as CEO, I mean the big man, the man on top of this giant corporation, he would spend hours every single Sunday writing handwritten thank you notes to associates, and and this wasn't just to like store managers, right? It wasn't the big wigs of the store. It was about cashiers. It was about the people who walked the aisles and stocked the shelves. It was about all of them. He would write these notes thanking them for their hard work. Can you imagine the impact of getting a letter from a CEO of a, of a, I looked and Home Depot had around $110 billion in revenue last year. I mean, for someone like that to take the time and to spend some time writing those handwritten notes to say thank you, that's some humility. And friends, I, I promise you, if we would take the time to cultivate a sense of humility within our life, not only would it impact the people around us, and I truly believe that it would soften their hearts maybe to the message that we have to share with them, but friends, I believe that it would grow our faith and our relationship with God. It would pull down the barriers. It would pull down some of those roadblocks that maybe we've been hitting up against over and over again, and we'd see some amazing things as God begins to grow us when we become humble. Let me pray for us. Control that they are just holding on to, but you are calling them to let go this morning. Father, I pray that you would help them to do that. And Lord, if we can be a help with them, Lord, would you prompt them? Would you push them to come to us and say, hey, Look, I need, a, I need some help with this. I need to let go of this pride. I need to let go of this control. I need to give it over to God. I need to trust Him. Whatever it might be, Lord, help us. Help us to humble ourselves so that you can lift us up sometimes. God, our Savior, God, our matchless King, 
God, your glory never faltering. Your mercy forever. Your mercy for all. Oh, Lord, my God, when in awesome wonder sing my soul, your song again. Oh, Lord, my God, when I'm lost in wonder sing my soul, how great. it up with me, ready? God, I promise, God, I come again, God, I make a God of everything, your justice forever, your justice Everybody, y'all have a great Sunday. Thank you so much for singing with us. God bless.